Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It, it's uh, it's a little after 6:30, so we're just gonna uh, we're gonna start. Uh, my name is Bob Sullivan. I'm one of the counselors at large. I'm joined by uh, uh, Councilor Ann Borgard, uh, Councilor Susan Nicastro, uh Councilor Jean Bradley Derencourt. I know Councilor Shirley Azak is here, and, and Councilor uh, Councilor at large Moises Rodriguez is here as well, and of course Councilor at large uh, Wynn Farwell. Um, tonight we're here actually to listen. The whole purpose of this is to listen to you. Um, you're going to be able to speak uh, to us. Uh, we're not going to engage. We're not going to deliberate. I want to make that clear. We're not voting on anything tonight. We're not deliberating on anything tonight. We're here to listen. And it's a fact-finding mission. We just want to hear from you. Uh, whatever it is you want to say, by all means, you have the floor. We have to limit it because of timing. We're only going to be here tonight until 8 o'clock. So like two to three minutes. Uh, the protocol is going to be, uh, if you could please come and, and there's a sign-in sheet there, if you could sign your name. And then when you come up to the microphone, again, if you could just state your name and your address for the record. I know uh, minutes are being taken for this evening. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to uh, throw it to uh, Councilor Farwell. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sullivan. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be very brief. We have a handout. This handout is nothing more than a letter from the city solicitor, which was sent to the Ordinance Committee on July 25th. Uh, it includes information that was provided to us by the city solicitor. You will see two or three zoning maps in, in here. I don't know which one is more helpful. This one, which says unofficial map, uh, and it's not in color, but the dark areas are the C2 and C3 zones, which were recommended by the mayor for retail marijuana locations. Uh, and then you will find some information, uh, because obviously this issue has been decided and implemented in the state of Washington and in uh, Colorado, and in particular Denver and Denver County. You'll find that as part of the packet. Uh, there will be six licenses that will eventually be issued. We, are, we have to have eight. It's 20% of your alcoholic beverages licenses. We have about 40, uh, 37, 38 of them. So there's going to be eight licenses. Two will go to the dispensaries that are already in place, and the other six will go somewhere in the city. And just to echo what Councillor Sullivan said, this is a listening and learning experience for us. We've never done this in Brockton before. So we're not going to discuss, debate, vote, recommend, or do anything else. We, we really sincerely want to hear what you would recommend, where you would like to see retail shops located. What hours of operation? Um, how far away from playgrounds, uh, schools, uh, churches? It, it's really, you know, it's our city, but we want to listen and learn. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Councilor Durenincourt if he wants to make very brief opening remarks, and then we'll go down to uh, Councilor uh, Borgad. And Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is John Bradley, the Winnan Court, and I am one of the uh, four counselors at large. And like my two colleagues already stated, um, we are here this evening um, to listen to you, to listen to you and to what you have to say. So uh, my job is going to be the entire thing, just listen to you. I will not make any comments, but I will definitely take um, everything that you guys will be saying into considerations and, um, and, and take it from there. So I'm here to listen. I think all of us are here to just listen to you guys. So thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm Ian Beauregard, the Ward 5 City Council. We want to emphasize a couple of things. First of all, this is one of uh, two meetings. We wanted to have one as close to the next ordinance uh, committee meeting that uh, Councilor at Lodge, Bob Sullivan, will be announcing as they, they make the arrangements. Uh, people don't realize how you have to get everyone lined up and together. This involves a lot of individuals. We encourage everyone, if you feel a little uncomfortable to speak uh, this evening, this is all being recorded so that anyone that couldn't make it can see it on community access. But also, we're going to, we're, uh, you know, ready to take emails, phone calls, uh, letters, uh, you know, in the traditional sense. And if you run into us in other locations, and we'll be happy to listen to your concerns. Uh, that's what we're here for, to hear your concerns, your questions. We don't have all the answers. This is new to all of us. And we're grateful that you care enough about the community to be here this evening. And for those that, you know, 
can't make it on vacation or what have you, we have some school committee individuals that are very interested in what's going on, and they have a special, um, what do I call it, subcommittee meeting this evening, so they are unable to attend. So there's many people that can't be here tonight that are also concerned. We will be having another meeting, and we will let people know as it you know comes closer. It will obviously be probably after the middle of September. But thank you again for coming this evening, and uh, again, we encourage you to speak and you know, express your concerns and questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Moses Rodriguez. I'm one of the uh, at-large counselors here in the city as well. Um, and as it's been said uh, to, from my colleagues to the left, um, we're not here to discuss, uh, you know, how you feel about the uh, marijuana law, how you don't feel about the, the law. I think that ship has sailed in a sense that we're here to basically discuss some ideas, some thoughts, some suggestions, some constructive um, uh, ideas and what can we do to make what we have to do uh, better for the city and useful for the city. We can sit here and, and whether or not you were for it, against it, whatever the deal was back in the days, um, it's the law in the state. It's, uh, it's something that we have to look into as far as, uh, you know, how can the city of, uh, of Brockton benefit from this particular law that was passed and to make sure that we do the right thing for the citizens of the city. Uh, just because you might feel one way or the other about this, it doesn't mean that you do not share your thoughts or ideas. And frankly, uh, as a member of the, uh, of the ordinance committee, I think it's important for the, uh, the citizens to have some serious input uh, on, in this particular issue. Uh, this is brand new to every single one of us. Anybody that actually has an idea or some thoughts on how this whole thing is gonna function, they're just fooling themselves. We don't know what, what worked well in, in Colorado or in Washington. It doesn't mean it's gonna work well in Massachusetts or in Brockton. So, this is brand new for all of us, and I think it's important for all of us to uh, to uh, bind ourselves together and do this in a best possible way we can to better the lives of Rockton. Thank you. I'm Susan Castro. I'm the Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm taking the minutes tonight. <laughs> so I sat near the, the microphone so I could hear everything. Thank you so much for being here. We had a sign-in sheet, and we don't want to miss anyone, so I'm, I'm going to call the names, uh, and uh, if, if you didn't intend to speak, that's fine, but if you do, please come up and pick a microphone. So, Jill Wiley? I'll pass for the moment. Pass for the moment, okay. Uh, David Willette? I'll pass for the moment. All right. Everybody's passing. <laughs> Ann Tebow? <laughs> do, do we have some shy uh, wallflowers here, or uh, <laughs> I, I hope we aren't that intimidating. Uh, uh, how about uh, how about anybody that wants to speak? Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just yeah, I, I guess we've got to. Whoever wants to speak, back. just come up to a podium. Yeah, just come yeah. up to the podium. Again, you have to state your name for the minutes, please. Thank you. That gentleman right here, yes, sir. Hi, George Carey. I live at 62 Ettrick Street, and I've lived there for 30 years. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, five councillors who voted that we should have a vote on this. I'm sorry you lost, and I consider that a shame. Uh, we're going to be known as basically the dope capital of the world, or the pot capital of the world. And I feel that's going to hurt Brockton in its... Uh, trying to bring in people from outside to start businesses. We are hurting in that area. Uh, but I would like to give a couple of suggestions about what we're dealing with, where to locate things. I'll start off with something a little bit way out. Uh, first of all, my first belief was when I heard this happen, I really wanted basically the six different uh, establishments uh, to be located in areas where they would be noted the most. Uh, first of all, the first one should be next to the home of the uh, mayor of the city. Yeah. And the other five should be located near the councilors who voted for what they did. 
Okay, that's a little bit facetious. They're in residential areas, we can't do it. I would like to see, though, looking at what we are allowed to do, to consider where we put them. And I do feel that locating them uh, in areas where we have a lot of people, a lot of businesses, is probably going to hurt those businesses and those people. If we have to have six ones, I'd like to, first of all, can I ask, uh, the two in the downtown area, is that essential there be two there or just no more than two? No. That, that, it's up for debate and discussion. That will be decided at a public meeting when, okay. when the debate and discussion and deliberations. All right. Uh, if that's the case, let me just work it on two downtown, four outside of town. My feeling about the two downtown, at least one of them should be located in uh, basically our uh, city hall. And it can be located on the second floor, which makes it legal. And my feeling is that it would be a great place for that business. Hopefully uh, they'll see it more or less what the problems will be uh, having a business that location. If we could have two of them, fine. If not, my second choice down there would be the uh, Neighborhood Health Center. Again, it's a location that a lot of people visit, and it would be uh, cut off from most of the businesses. And again, uh, we really do have to get the businesses going again downtown. Okay, my other choice is for the other four. Okay, can I just make one more thing? Is that we locate the other four near the boundaries of the city. And the reason for that is twofold, one of which is not to uh, hurt the businesses in the city, and secondly, to make people who want to come in from outside easy access to them. So I was looking at this, there's a lot of C2 areas, for example, on both sides of Main Street, uh, the far ends of it, right at the borders, that could be used for those. We also have other ones, again, that are near the borders of the other ones, again, could be used for them. And by setting those up, you will have uh, opened it up. You will also get more, I think, traffic from outside of Brockton. And secondly, you will not destroy the downtown and the business areas. So that's more or less where I'd want it to go. Hi, everybody. James Swain, 15 Abbott Place. Right in the heart of Ward 2. Give it a lot of thought to this, and I'll be honest with you. I'll give you a little background on me. I'm 27 years clean and sober, so anything having to do with drugs concerns me in this city. But I'm also a realist, and I realize that this city can't afford to throw revenue out the door. Give it a lot of hard, careful thought. I'm not pro-pot. I'm not anti-pot. I'm pro-revenue, I'm pro-Brockton, I'm pro-the people of Brockton. I believe in the champions of this city, not the Marcianos and the Haglers and the Brockton Boxers, but the people that roll up their sleeves every day and get their hands dirty to keep this city afloat. And as one of those people who's been here for almost 30 years getting my hands dirty and fighting the good fight, I gave some long, hard thought to how this city should approach this that the people voted for in the, in the majority. And my model is basically similar to what the mayor proposes the C2, C3 zoning, the two downtown. I think we have to need, keep two, I think we need two downtown. I thought six was excessive. I thought it was counterproductive not only to the businesses but to the downtown core. I also believe that we have four economically depressed areas in this city outside of downtown. Our east side is starting to slip. We just lost the conference center. You know, we lost the project that was supposed to go in there from Massasoit. And the plazas are starting to lose businesses. We've got a homeless encampment down behind the new Popeyes. Mm -hmm. We need to draw attention to these areas. We need to draw revenues to this area. So I'd like to see us have one on the east side in that area. <coughs> South side, this is my darling, and I'll tell you why. Because yes, it could benefit from the foot traffic and the extra traffic that a retail shop is going to generate but it could also benefit from us taking advantage of the more powerful aspect of this, which is the cultivation, testing, packaging, 
and other processes that go into this pro into creating the product for the retail stores to sell. That's where our jobs are. That's where we're going to create large amounts of traffic. That's where we're going to create more demand for housing, and that's where we're going to drive the the economy on the south side back to where it used to be when we had Shaw's down there and when we had all these other businesses down there. One on the west side and one on, of course, the north side. I would like to see one near, not at, but near Westgate Mall, either the industrial way there or Westgate Drive area to take advantage of the resurgence that we're starting to see at Westgate Mall. We're starting to see more businesses come in. We just opened a Chipotle. We've got a uh, Starbucks down there. We've got a uh, Chick-fil-A coming in. We've got Planet Fitness coming in. We've got Burlington Coat Factory coming in. Why not give those businesses a fighting chance to really make it by establishing something there that we know is going to establish traffic? So those are my suggestions. And I'll be honest with you. I'm running for council in 2019, but I'm glad I'm not there now. Because <laughs> I would not want to have to make the decisions that all 11 of these men and women have had to make. Uh, I've seen the comments. Mo many of you may know me from social media. You know, many of you see my campaign. Many of you know that I'm not a guy that keeps his mouth shut. I have no reverse gear. I have very few filters, but I'm passionate about this city. And regardless of which side the counselors fell on in this, I felt for their decision and the decision-making process they had to go through because this one is a nightmare. But with that being said, I'll close with saying this. We as a city have spent far too long walking away from revenue. It's time we start bringing it back to the city because of the very simple fact that the taxpayers can't do it anymore by themselves. We cannot continue to rely on Prop two and a half overrides or being right at Prop two and a half and having to po possibly put that on the table. We can't keep going up on the property assessments without the people getting what they're paying for in this city anymore. We can't do it. So we need to hit this one out of the park. And I applaud you, gentlemen, I certainly, and you ladies. I certainly do. Because this, like I said, it's a tough call, but Brockton needs this one. Good evening, counselors. I'm Lynn Smith. I live at 34 Carlisle. First, I'd like to thank the Fearless Five for this opportunity um, to speak. I wish the entire council had given us the right to vote in November, but that wasn't meant to be. So I guess we'll have to voice our opinion this way. But thank you to the counselors who had the courage to vote yes um, on a possible referendum. Um, I also need to claim my seat and, in full disclosure, tell you that I am a person with long-time sobriety, which means it's 23 years since I've had a drink or drug one day at a time. So I come at this topic slightly jaded because I've seen what drugs um, can do to homes and families and people. What I would like to ask you to consider, for example, is the permit process. Who's going to decide on permits? Is it going to be a smaller licensing board, or is it going to be in a public open forum that is open to the public, that is taped, that there are minutes and a decision made by the city council, for example? So I am firmly on the side of the city council deciding who's going to get permits, because I'd like to participate in that and listen to it and see the transparency in the system. I'd also like to know who's going to do annual reviews of these businesses. I'd like to know who's going to oversee any transfers of license. I'd like to know who's going to oversee the ordinance enforcement and any violations. Who's going to be monitoring these businesses? Do we have the capacity to monitor them? Is it going to be the Board of Health? Do we have the people to do it? Do we have the police force? Is it their job? With six men on the street, six patrolmen for a city of 100,000 people, do we have enough police power to do that? I'd also like you to consider buffer zones. In many cities, there are 1,000-foot buffer zone. I believe in California, there's a minimum of 600 feet required in terms of buffer zones. I'd like to see you be as aggressive as possible on your buffer zones. I'd like to see you protect schools, playgrounds, recreational facilities, childcare facilities, public parks, churches, public transit centers, libraries, 
drug rehabilitation facilities, substance abuse facilities, detox facilities. I'd like to see a ban on any of these locations in residential neighborhoods, and I'd like to see you address the downtown mixed use, you know? Our mantra for downtown is residential, residential, residential. How does that jibe with um, recreational marijuana um, shops? You know, if you think about the 600-foot barrier, I'd just like to give you some statistics. Now, this is Google Maps, so it might not be right to the foot, I work at 144 Main Street. In the basement of my business is a church that's 148 feet from me, 148 feet. If you think about Joe Angelo's, which is a downtown landmark that everybody knows where it is, right? From Joe Angelo's to the Brockton Public School headquarter building is 200 feet. To the family resource um, facility right across the street, the Studensky facility, it's 397 feet. And to stairway recovery, it's 1,000 feet. From my office to Luminosity, which is a substance abuse and rehab counseling um, center, it's 482 feet. From Joe Angelo's to Luminosity, it's 560 feet. From Joe Angelo's to the library, it's 550 feet. And from Joe Angelo's to the neighborhood health center, it's a little over 1,000 feet. So if you're going to start to talk about buffer zones, I think you really need to look at what's going to protect. I found my sobriety in the church basements. Take a look at the churches. Where are their AA meetings? Where are they NA meetings? Are you going to protect those people that are trying to find sobriety one time, day at a time? I'd also like you to, you to take a look at what happened in Denver. There was a study in 2014 where these facilities are put predominantly in census tracts of poor people. 29% of the shops went in areas where people had high income. 46% of the shops went in areas of low income. So are we going to put people who have challenges in terms of their income um, at higher risk? Many of you came to the licensing hearing when we thought that giving a liquor license to the stop and gas at Warren and Legion wasn't a great idea. So if it wasn't a good idea to bring that alcohol into the mix downtown, I can't see how bringing pot into downtown is a good thing. Licensing is supposed to protect the public. That's why plumbers have licenses. That's why hairdressers have licenses. So I hope you use your licensing capacity and your ordinance capacity to protect the public. Thank you. Council oh. Castro, do you have all that down now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Ollie Spears. I live at 69 Bud Ave here in Brockton, lifelong resident of the city. And I'm, I'm here personally. Um, myself, I don't smoke marijuana, but I have family members that benefit from the use of marijuana. So when people say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, personally, marijuana is affecting my family, it's helping my family, um, so I'm for it. Um, but at the same time, we have to be realistic. We don't want the casino. We don't, we don't want the power plant. We don't want this, we don't want that. We have to, have, we have to start somewhere with, some, with, with generating some type of revenue. So if marijuana passed through the state of Massachusetts, let's benefit from it. Because right now when I drive down Main Street, when I drive down Belmont Street, when I drive down Warren Ave, the city looks like crap. And with the revenue, we can make the city look a lot better. Because when my family comes in from Brockton, comes to Brockton, they're like, what happened? This city, it's falling apart, and we need the revenue to make sure that we could sustain without going up on the taxes, without going up on people, our, our, our hard-earned money. So when I say it's personal for me, it's definitely personal for me. You know, a couple years ago in Ward 7, Father Bill was building um, a veterans home, and everybody was crying. Oh, we don't need it. We don't need Ward 7. They're going to come here. It's going to be bad. You know, we don't want it in the neighborhood. Two years later, it's the best looking building on North, Moore, on North Main Street. Oh, sorry, Ward 6. I apologize. It's the best building on Ward 6. So we can't keep beating the drum saying, don't, we don't want it. We don't want it. We, have, we need it. 
we need the revenue so that I'm good. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'd like to thank, my name is Ellie Wentworth, 584 Court Street in Brockton. I'd like to thank you also, those of you who are courageous enough to stand up for what you believe in, for whatever reason it may be. I want to quote from something a very famous and revered man said in the 20th century, Martin Luther King Jr. And it's kind of in response to this issue of, we didn't want a casino, we don't want drug centers, we didn't want the power plant. None of those were for the good health of our city. The power plant was not thought of the health of the people over there. The casino wanted, people wanted to build it next to a school. And now the uh, pot shops are going to be downtown where all the places that Miss Smith just mentioned. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. So when we put our money first and we don't do our due diligence and the hard work to find good businesses, healthy businesses with good jobs to come to the city, that's creative altruism. We spent a lot of effort on that casino. I play slot machines. I don't, didn't want it near a high school. Um, I do not smoke pot. <laughs> Never did. I, well, that's not true once. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, tried to, I tried to do a somersault, so I never did it again. <laughs> um, whether or not we are against or for legal pot shops downtown, another site in Broughton or no pot shops at all, we need to be open-minded to any statistics that are given for either pro or con. As many of us know, the two greatest lies are the checkers in the mail, and as a senior analyst with a very major student loan company, I know that statistics do lie. As many of us know, the two greatest lies, yeah, I'm sorry. With that in mind, I have tried to be open-minded about this discussion, but have to admit that I've gone into it with no experience myself, except for that little episode that I mentioned, <laughs> but have observed the behavior of people who smoke it regularly. Some of them are very close to me. And that is my biggest problem, the effect of those who smoke pot regularly. I'm not going to go through everything that I gathered here, but I did a lot of research. And uh, one of the things that shocked me was in USA News by Alexa Ladiri, staff writer, May 31st, 2018. So this is an old statistic. This isn't, isn't old news. Some 22.3 percent of fatally injured motorists who were tested for drugs tested positive for marijuana in 2016, a figure that researchers say has increased substantially in recent years as states have legalized the drug for recreational or medicinal use, according to a new report. The finding in a study released Thursday by the Governor's Highway Safety Association was one of several regarding the growing prevalence of drugs in vehicle fatalities. The report also found that 44% of drivers killed in automobile accidents in 2016 who were tested for drugs tested positive for one or more substances, a number that was up 28% from 10 years prior. That figure eclipsed the 37.9% who were known to have been tested for alcohol and tested positive, a figure that actually fell in the last decade from 41 percent. Regarding what some are saying about the money that's going to be uh, generated, there are going to be more and more of the pot shops, so I worry about the predictions of income that's going to come to the city. As far as jobs are concerned, Bud trimmers prepare marijuana plants for retail sa uh, sale. They are the most uh, highly employed. They average $8 to $12 an hour, and it takes about 10 minutes to train them. Bud tenders who sell marijuana to customers at dispensaries typically make about $14 an hour. 
The job requires an in-depth knowledge of cannabis strains and products and a bartender-like rapport with customers. In Colorado and also Michigan, when medical marijuana is legal, bud tenders are required to have licenses. As far as raising marijuana, the master extractor at Acme Elixirs, a producer of THC and CBD chews and vape pens, earns $250,000 a year, said founder and CEO Peter Pietrangeli. But he said that even with that level of pay, it's hard to recoup, recruit and keep these workers because after a while they get the funding to build their own labs. Becoming a master extractor requires a PhD in biochemistry. So you have to think about that if you think it's going to be easy to raise it. The amount of THC in marijuana has been increasing steadily over the past few decades. I'm only mentioning this because I'd like you to, most people don't understand that don't smoke marijuana, don't understand the difference between THC and CBD. Key findings on adolescent drug use, uh, Institute for Social Research, the University of Michigan, 2015. So, Points to remember are that mar marijuana refers to the dried leaves, flowers, stems, and seeds from the cannabis sativa or cannabis indica plant. The plant contains the mind-altering chemical THC, and you did notice that I said mind-altering. That is why people smoke pot. That's why we drink. That's why we have a, a, a highball or a, or a beer. It's because we want to feel different, and we do when we have one. Let's face the facts. We have to say what things are. The plant contains uh, mind-altering chemical THC and other related compounds. People use marijuana by smoking, eating, drinking, or inhaling it. And one of the things that worries me is that the, are these foods that they're making. And I remember when my kids were young, they used to have brownies. My son sent him, asked me to send him some brownies when he was in uh, ba uh, base camp in the Navy. And I didn't know that it was a joke. So, but uh, he didn't like my brownies. Uh, in any case, <laughs> THC, on the other hand, overactivates certain brain cell receptors, resulting in effects such as altered senses, changes in mood, impaired body movement, difficulty with thinking and problem solving, impaired memory and learning. Marijuana can have a wide range of health effects, including hallucinations and paranoia, breathing problems, possible harm to fetuses' brains in pregnant women. Yes. Yes. Just as a time check, yes. I'm trying to stay in about five minutes. So okay. Know, so I'm done. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, my my biggest worry is the uh, the daily user of marijuana. Thank you. Good evening, Jean Holmes, 65 Belcher Ave. And like everyone else, I want to thank um, the five counselors here for having the courage to, to stand up and, and allow um, people to be heard. Um, it is important for people to be heard even if we don't accept what they say. It's important for people to at least be able to have that chance to be heard. So thank you to all of you. Um, I would uh, piggyback to many of the comments. We have a law in Massachusetts, I believe it's still on the book, that no drug should be sold within 1,000 feet of schools, parks, et cetera, in the many places that Lynn Smith mentioned. And I think that this council should look to um, increase that, that zone uh, that Lynn mentioned uh, to the 1,000 feet. That actually would be consistent with our current drug laws. Um, now, understanding that this is legal sale, but again, I don't think that it changes the idea of it, which is that law was put into place in order to protect the children um, and individuals attending churches, the drug area, the, the drug rehab facilities, all of those should have a thousand foot buffer zone, or maybe more, but at a minimum, a thousand foot, just like our laws. As far as where these should be placed, um, again, I, I think some good ideas are here. Um, I don't believe that there needs to be more than one downtown. I think there should be one downtown. I think it should be in a very visible area where it can be monitored very, very closely. Um, and so I think one downtown is more than enough because we do. We're encouraging people to live down there, and there's people that live downtown, and they complain 
about what is going on downtown. So I don't think that having more pot shops is going to help them feel any better about where they're going to go uh, for their nightly walk or anything. So I think one downtown is, is, is more than enough. I think look to the outskirts because that does increase the, the number of people um, that will come from out of town. They will make their purchases. And they'll either venture further on into the city or they'll go back home. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I think that that is where you get the most bang for your buck. So um, those are ideas that I would uh, ask the council to consider. I also ask the council to consider making sure that there is a solid code enforcement um, in place. Um, I actually was looking up something the other day on the um, web, and I was shocked to see uh, in 2011, about every other uh, log in the Brockton police log said, code enforcement, this location, code enforcement, call this location, code enforcement call this location, and we don't have any code enforcement at all. So we've got to make sure that we come back up to that standard, not just with this, but with everything, but particularly with this, where you have dedicated code enforcement officers that are going to know what signs are, are when there's trouble, um, what things that they need to be making sure are happening, make sure that they are enforcing the law as, as you all want it. So I think that that has to be in place um, if you're going to do this. Otherwise, it's just going to be the same problems that we have everywhere else with the uh, chop shops and everything else. So you got to have that in place. I think the council needs to either themselves be voting on these licenses um, or making sure that you have solid individuals who will not be swayed by the, the dazzling dollars uh, that are uh, waved in front of them, uh, but people that are really going to push hard and say, you know what, you're not going to get this just because you are a friend of a friend of a friend or anything else. You're going to require that whoever gets these licenses actually gets them because they are the best person to do the right job in this city given that we're going to have this. And I'm not going to speak on for or against marijuana. That is not what we're here for. But I would ask you to consider making sure that you either as a council vote and maybe have a requirement that your vote be three quarters of the council has to approve a license. That will really ensure that there is a, a, a complete consensus on who is the right person to get these licenses and who isn't. If you don't have that, then I encourage you not to rely upon, quite frankly, the boards that we have here in the city, because the boards here that we have in the city really are not um, manned with the necessary people to make these important decisions and to make sure that the laws are followed once the licenses are um, issued. That we don't have people being brought up for many, many other problems in the city, be it the automobile shops, be it the liquors, be it any of these. So, and, and the efforts to get them to be held accountable just doesn't happen. And I just think it's partly because we just don't have the strong people on those boards to do it. So maybe create your own board. If you don't want to do it as city councilors, create your own board and you hire and you decide who is going to actually be able to make these hard decisions and not be swayed by political favor or dazzling dollars. So those are some of the things that I would ask you to seriously consider when you are looking at this. Yes, look at other places, but you know, as, as Moses said, it may not work in Brockton what um, worked in other places. But we've got to make sure that we understand what we're doing as far as issuing the licenses. The other piece of it is where is the money going to go? I urge you to make sure that whatever monies is going to be generated, allegedly, from these pot shops, that we have a solid grip on not only how much money we're going to get, but also where that money is going to go. Um, and so I, I, I urge you to think about that as well. I don't know if there's a set rate that we know what's going to be the revenue, um, but I would also make sure that when you're writing this ordinance that you can review that. So say a pot shop is doing really, really well, <laughs> well, maybe you can just ask them for a little bit more revenue. So put that in there to make sure that you can continue to go back and get the extra dollars so that these people who think that they're going to come in and make money off of the backs of, quite frankly, um, individuals like, you know, was noted, uh, individuals that are, are more poor, um, we don't have that. In fact, we make sure that we're going to keep going back to them and saying, well, you, you reached that mark, but you know what? Based upon your sales, we can take a little bit more from you and we're going to. So put those ideas in, in, and, and put them into place. You can't just have ideas and not have them in place because the only way you can enforce them is, is, is if it's written down. I know that's tedious. 
but you really need to make sure and, and write that really solidly in there as well. So um, again, I, I urge you to continue to have these hearings and open up um, the floor for other ideas. These are just a few that I have thought of, so thank you. Thank you, councilors, for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Gary Leonard. I live at 82 Bryan Drive in Brockton. I'm a lifelong Brocktonian, and I'm here to give you information that I've obtained from a face-to-face -face discussion with Boulder, Colorado's mayor, cannabis commissioner, and members of their Marijuana Advisory Council. What they realized that this was, and I'm not going to talk about product at all because I really don't care about the product. I'm talking about industry and industry only. And that's my conversation with these people. And what they found out is this business in this industry is a catalyst. And what it creates is vibrancy and blighted in unused areas like downtown Brockton and to revitalize it and to gain equity and the uh, property owners uh, can finally get storefronts occupied by giving them the opportunity of just having dispensaries on the second floor level and below grade. And this was all discovered by a, a former government uh, which they called their Marijuana Advisory Council which is made up of 10 members mostly municipal employees, such as uh, a member of the fire department, police department, building department, health department, school department. Uh, there was two members from two different colleges and two citizens. Uh, most of these people were the people who were uh, against having this product in their city. So they were very objective in what they were looking at. And they were the ones who would come and discover what was right and what was wrong with this industry. And at first, what Boulder did was put them on the outskirts of the city, as a lot of people said that that's where they like to see it happen. But what it didn't do was give any opportunity for businesses that were located more centralized to their downtown. So after two years, they finally figured it out that they should actually corral them in their downtown, which they did do. And I want you to know that they have, I believe it's 22 dispensaries and 29 uh, grow ops in their downtown area, but you can't find one. You have to ask somebody where they're located. There is no fanfare whatsoever. And in downtown Boulder, where it used to be uh, maybe 1,000 people down there per day, now they're entertaining over 10 to 15,000 people per day because they actually found out how to use this business as a tool. The tool was, thank you. The tool was is to make sure that there was no fanfare. They were all located on the second floor or below grade levels. That was making sure there was no congregations on the sidewalks or the streets. Uh, that would alleviate panhandlers for coming and looking for money. Also, discarding of rubbish and trash on the sidewalk and streets. Also, for people who dress like me and are pretty well known in the um, area, uh, want to be more discreet and didn't want to be seen in these facilities. And again, leaving the storefronts open for capitalism to take over and fill them up. And this is exactly what happened within six months after they corralled them to their downtown. The rent, they were all, all the voids were now taken and rented. Some rents doubled, some tripled in price. But they had them all rented and they had a downtown they could be proud of. Then they started having, with their host agreements, they made sure that they all conformed. Um, they started to paint all the buildings the same color. They finally had a theme going on. And then they started to hire int uh, street entertainers. Now, they were very choosy about their street entertainers. Most of the entertainers they have there um, have... Uh, they're, they're in the book, Guinness Book of Records. Uh, they're renowned people. They work about five months out of the year, and they make enough money that they can travel around the world the rest of the time. Um, they pay $1,000 per week for a permit. They give out eight permits per week. So they're getting $8,000. That generates $400,000 in revenue, another stream of income that they weren't expecting, but they found out because they put them all together and found out how this mechanism works. And how it works is they have to travel through the city. They might have to buy coffee, get gas, um, maybe even have lunch, God forbid, if they have lunch in Brockton. But they'd have to come through the city and go out through the city, giving all opportunity to business people to uh, advertise and promote themselves on the new traffic coming within. And this is what Boulder did, and that's why they're the most successful model in Colorado today. But again, everybody's more focused on the product. You've got to think about industry. 
And we haven't even talked about our factories yet. The way the proposal that the mayor has is all in industrial parts, which is I-1 zone. Most of our vacant factories are in I-2 zones. These factories can be utilized by not just the grow-ups, but if you have a strategy and a long-term plan, which I do, um, hemp products, which is already, some hemp products are already approved in 50 states. Hemp is the stock of a male cannabis plant. There is no CDB, there is no THC, there's nothing in it. Actually, your rope that you buy today is made of hemp, which is that stock of that plant. But it can also be made for hats, belts, pocketbooks, wallets, and believe it or not, people, even shoes. Imagine that, we were the shoe capital of the world, and maybe we can bring that industry back. So let's stop thinking about product, and let's start thinking about industry, and let's get the ball rolling. Thank you very much for your time. All right, so like I said, I believe marijuana should be welcomed into Brockton like any other legitimate business because that's what it is. It's time to dispense with misconceptions. Thank you. That retail marijuana will cater to junkies, lowlifes, and criminals. That's far from the case. I believe the main consumers of recreational pot will be middle class with disposable income because it's not going to be cheap. College-educated, professional, hard-working, middle-class consumers are the primary market for recreational pot. In other words, consumers which Brockton should be doing everything in its power to attract, not ban or drive away from, away into neighboring towns, towns which will be competing with Brockton for all manner of retail revenue. Pot stores should be allowed in all business-owned areas of the city, subject, of course, to the same types of sensible regulations, licensing, and oversight that currently apply to other um, adult-only products. I don't agree that there should be unique burdens added to the licensing and permitting process that are may be intended to discourage retail establishments, or that the license commission shouldn't handle it and that it should go to the city council. I, I think it should be treated similar to liquor stores and I just don't want to see added burdens that are intended to prevent or discourage it from est getting established. I would wholeheartedly welcome pot stores in Ward 5 business districts such as Crescent or Sedna Street plazas, areas that desperately need the revitalization that new business can bring and again from which Brockton desperately needs tax revenue. Retail marijuana will attract desirable consumers, stimulate further business growth, broaden the city's tax base, and provide much needed tax relief for homeowners and businesses. Regarding the buffer zones, I can agree a thousand feet from schools, sounds sensible. I was reading through the Washington list of restricted entities, and I think when you start throwing in libraries, churches, childcare, public transit, playgrounds, arcades, a thousand feet from any one of those things will be excessively prohibitive and you could draw circles that would probably rule out most of the city. Um, as far as retail hours, I think the, the hours should be like any other retail business. Um, so I will just finish with this. Marijuana is poised to become an extremely lucrative industry in Massachusetts. And Brockton voters have already spoken on this issue the city should do right by taxpayers and open the door to this new opportunity. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Boyd. I live at 24 Wall Street, and I'm a lifelong resident here in Brockton. And most of what I want to say, I, I had prepared remarks, but I think I'm just going to speak off the cuff. Um, I'm really for bringing this downtown, and the reason I am is is I think that the foot traffic. You know, I'm I'm coming from a, a long uh, career in retail. Um, you know, I, I managed a few stores, Rite Aid. Uh, I worked at BJ's for a few years, um, so I know the importance of foot traffic and and what the businesses around a business can do. Uh, you know, for a growing business or a potential business, um, and. 
you know, some of you might know me. <laughs> I, I run a 56,000 member group called the Brockton Hub. It's a community Facebook page. Um, I get a lot of complaints. Uh, I see a lot of complaints about what Brockton used to be, how it needs to be. Uh, a lot of it centered around uh, downtown. Um, and I think that the f increase in foot traffic is, is, is going to be great for Brockton. Uh, it's going to make downtown more attractive for potential business owners to come down and open their business. And that, as Gary said, uh, you know, these marijuana retail locations would be uh, above or below uh, street level. So um, there, there wouldn't be any, uh, you know, any flash around it or anything. It, it, it looked pretty nice going downtown with retail shops left and right, people walking down, parking, relaxing. I, I, I think it's a no brainer. Um, I look at Prova, for example. Now, I've been there all but one night. I went opening night. I did not go the night after that, but I've been there ever since. And every night. <laughs> and it's, it's mostly because of comfort level. I mean, I've lived in Brockton 36 years now. I don't hang out downtown. More often than not, I don't even hang out in Brockton unless I'm frequenting the Cod or, you know, George's Cafe, all of our staples here. Um, but, I put myself downtown and I look around, I see the crowd, um, it, it's a good decent crowd, you know, it's not drawing rabble rousers and, and trouble, uh, there aren't homeless hanging out in front of it or panhandlers, um, it, it, it's just wonderful to be downtown and you look around and then you see City Hall in the distance and you're like, oh my god, I'm in Brockton? It's, it's, it's incredible and, and, and the idea here would be to have uh, a, a great, uh, you want all of these retail locations to reap the benefits of, of marijuana coming in. And like Gary said, it's really about the industry, not the product. I don't want anyone to get hung up on, you know, all of the side effects of this product because uh, it, medical science has shown that the benefits of it are, are incredible. Um, and, and there are a lot of success stories out there. Uh, get on Google, do your reading. Um, it, 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 it's a product that everybody whether you use CBD oil to relax or THC oil to, you know, get that hallucinogen feeling, um, uh, there's a benefit for everybody in it. Um, and, you know, I think uh, there were some people worried about, well, I don't want that stench downtown. Well, we're not talking about using it right out in the open. Um, you know, we're talking about going in and purchasing it and going about our business in our day. And I think, uh, again, just to circle back, um, I want to be able to buy that coffee and come downtown and hang out and maybe listen to some live entertainment, and that's after I've done my shopping there. You know, we, we have marijuana product there, but we're also going to have other retail locations, uh, you know, maybe food businesses, clothing. Um, it's going to make it more attractive for business to come to Brockton. So I, I think the revenue uh, is, is vitally important. Uh, we've closed doors to, you know, like we said, the casino, the power plant. And, you know, I know the issues around those, but, you know, we have to just stop and, and, and take the risk. We're going to make mistakes, but we're going to correct them, and we're going to move forward. We're going to make this work for us. We're going to bring in revenue. We're going to add police. We're going to have our teachers. We're going to have all of that stuff. We just need to start somewhere. So let's start here. That's all I have. Dennis Hirschi, 7 Kenwood Street, taxpayer, homeowner, citizen of Brockton, city activist. I want to bring up something. First, I want to commend the five counselors who tried very hard to give us the right to vote. I have a father who's a World War II veteran. He's still living. He was at Pearl Harbor, fought hand-to-hand -hand combat in New Guinea, and got blown up at Guadalcanal. When the vote came last week to deny us the right to vote, he was appalled. And if you look at the, the flyer here, I just want to read this and say, those of us who have enjoyed such privileges as freedom, democracy, and the right to vote should not forget in time that men have died to win them. Six counselors denied us that. Six counselors don't believe in these principles. And this is by Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I want to go on with something. Everybody says we need business downtown. Well, we need revenue. We have a city plan, a Bob May. Look what he's done for the city, okay? Rhetorically, that needs no comment.
Gary Leonard was the mayor of Main Street for many, many years. I don't know what he brought to downtown Brock and around, okay? But we had people who were supposed to be doing these things. They're still drawing money from the city payroll. They have been unsuccessful, but they're still drawing money from the city payroll. Now, I have been a school teacher for over 40 years. I will fight to protect the children. There is no reason in the world why a pot shop it should be within 1,000 feet of a school. No, there's no reason at all, period. I'm also, I'm not an overly religious person, but I also have Christian values. People who are Christians don't want pot shops and they should be protected too. There should not be a pot shop within 1,000 feet of a church. There should not be a pot shop within 1,000 feet of a daycare. That's appalling to even, to even suggest that. Protect the children, protect the churches, and protect the Christians. Now, we're going to have pot shops, but we have plenty of places where we can put them. We don't have to put them around churches, schools, daycares, and libraries. That, 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 honestly, that's ludicrousy to even think that way. Absolute ludicrousy. We have really, really kicked veterans in the butt by, by denying these people the right to vote. We have really kicked them in the butt. And believe me, a lot of people are appalled and won't forget it come the next election. Okay? Believe me, they won't. Now, you first statistics tonight, okay? You first statistics tonight that I think have been very misleading by the pro people. I don't smoke marijuana, I never did. I never even smoked cigarettes. God, well, I'm, I'm lucky I didn't because I was an athlete all my life, but I, but during all the women I've been with and all the beer I drank, I'd be in a lot of trouble. Okay? But you're going to hear some true statistics coming up. Okay? It's not, what you, it's not going to bring the revenue that you think it's going to bring. And it's not worth the cost of not protecting the children and not protecting the churches and not protecting the daycares and not protecting the libraries. Anybody who believes it should be within a thousand feet of any one of those, it's hogwash. Hogwash. I will fight for the children. We have five councillors who fought for the children. We have five councillors who believe in democracy, freedom, and the right to vote. And I know they're going to keep fighting for it. 1,000 feet, please. Thank you. Ryan Owens, uh, 21 Longwood Ave. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, you know, councillors as well. I um, actually wanted to meet all of you individually and talk. Um, I got some things I don't think, um, well, certainly you've not heard before. Um, but I got, a, unfortunately, sick, um, so got a little derailed. So this is prime, perfect opportunity. I apologize for the casual wear. I came from the pool with a uh, niece and nephew, eight and six, all day. And it was uh, just a couple hours ago I knew about this, so I came right over. Um, to couple on, or piggyback on some of the things I heard, um, Boulder, Colorado is absolutely the first thing I wanted to talk about. And the um, gentleman is 100% right. Um, because logistically, we're, on, we're in the other parts of the city, I assume in a retail strip center, do you find second floor walk-ups? You, know, you just don't see them. It's just not how real estate's built. It's all ground level pull up and get out and get in. Um, so I was just curious to that. Uh, regarding um, the law in itself, I think uh, the, uh, the commission did a very good job. Um, I've met with them and spoke with them um, at length. Um, you know, not to name drop, but uh, befriended Steve Hoffman. And they went to the other states and they found what was right and wrong or what could be tweaked because I, again, I was against this. I voted um, against it in that uh, understanding a couple of 60 Minutes pieces that um, just showed how they didn't do, do it right. And I think this state did it right. Um, with one shortcoming, and that is the human brain doesn't stop developing until about 25. Having in that the the legal age of 21 is just a few years too short, in my opinion. And where you do, where studies have found where you have um, addiction issues, and I've seen it in life, um, you know, perennial drug units, users from 14, 15, 16, there's still that mentality until they stop using drugs. And where you start that early, you can get real addiction problems um, 
in, in really sort of derail life. But as a mature adult, it may be, it, we'll see exactly what the studies show. Um, but I do want to um, answer a question on the revenue in itself. It's a 20% cap and it's really on revenue. There's almost no expenses you can pad in. It's very, uh, it's very stripped down operating statement where the taxes occur. That would be 625, the regular state revenue. The state also gets a, um, uh, just a marijuana, um, I can't remember the name of it. That's somewhere around the same percent, leaving the city either at three or maybe upwards to six. And what I advocate that that is done with is for the youth, predominant, uh, first and foremost, make sure that we are making sure the kids are having after school programs or parks, something that gives them the bridge to when the parents go home. I myself uh, left the job or uh, the corporate world and uh, found so much more beneficial things to do with my time. I volunteer, I mentor uh, in Boston. It's a neighborhood youth center where they are the bridge for the parents to go home. Just that three to five hours, you know, maybe we can get some of um, programs like that. I'm not sure what the city has, um, as well as social services. Anyone who uses substances, it's because they don't feel good about something. Frank Sinatra said he feels bad for anybody who doesn't drink. Well, I used to totally subscribe to that because the best part of their day was the moment they wake up. And then I found sobriety, and not over just any real need, but, well, kind of, being a weekend blackout drunk, but just want to change life. And now I look at anybody who does use substances as, you know, geez, what's missing in your life? What could I do to make it better? I talk to a lot of people, they open up to me, it's rather amazing. And there's a route to some of it, uh, most of it, sometimes just pains and such. But that is where this does come in. Uncle said to me, you know, he has a license to grow. You know, I joked to my mother, hey, your brother's a, a drug dealer. And he's like, no, 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 I serve medicine. I'm just like, whatever. That was a number of months ago. And then I started doing research and more research and talking to other people. And it absolutely is. The THC that's on the street that you can still get anywhere and we can literally throw a rock and in a few minutes we could probably get something, uh, some marijuana or any other drug. You know, that is high teens in its potency. What's sold in the retail stores, what really drives business right now is much higher than that. And it's definitely something that needs to be controlled in the home because it is very controlled in the retail. Where it goes from there, it's just not going to be something that is going to be probably found on the streets per se. But I totally agree. It's way powerful. Nothing I could ever mess with anymore. But the real important thing is the CBD. It literally is going to sweep the nation and the world. Mitch McConnell padded into the farm bill that gets approved every year a hemp bill. Hemp is being declassified. Hemp is the, the sister... The cousin plant, the sister plant, whatever you want to call it, of cannabis. Hemp in itself is high in CBD. I, right here, have from a friend hemp oil. Through my spinal cord injury, I have a lot of muscle, in, uh, muscle spasms and tone. Where I just started taking this, and it's just like, whoa, wow. I did not, I, I could just feel that it sort of relieved. And the amount of things that CBD does to the, that can help and cure, A, repairs the brain um, for, that the opioids do. Um, you have uh, Alzheimer's, it shows signs to taking away that, that white, um, that white uh, plaque or whatever it is, or gray plaque, whatever it is that you can see on the imaging that the brain's dying. CBDs have shown proof in that. Um, MS, believe Parkinson, um, anxiety, PTSD, the list goes on and on and on. If you look, it's unbelievable in where it is now about to be federally not so illegal, where now research can be done, because there's only a few uh, schools that do it in the country, and we rather lead the world in medicinal uh, or pharmaceuticals that now there won't be seven um, different agencies to go through and all the hoops to go through. But um, 
research will be done and it'll actually be shown as to what strains of plants actually do what because with cannabis in itself you can grow different flavors you can grow to different potencies hemp is the same way where you have anywhere between 40 or 100 different cbd is cannabinoid oils that do different things once we the you know big pharma figures out what does what for what person what ailment what cbd now we have an, an idea of how to bring it to the public and that is where I'm full-fledged, I just can't wait for it to happen. It's going to happen. Might be five, might be 10 years. Full disclosure, I'm Sheila and Joe Angelo's son. I'm looking at a retail and it's not to get people high. I don't subscribe to that. I'm gonna subscribe to, hey, what's going on? You ever try this stuff? Why don't you try this too? He, you know, I can't give him a free sample because everything is seed to sale, it's all tracked but I'm gonna promote this. And I really wanted to put a package together and present to the council individually, collectively, present to everybody here or beyond. I welcome a, a vote. Let's get together, let's talk about this, let's learn about this. Because there's a lot opportunity for people to not have to suffer because your body, you know, I don't know, you start to feel at 30, 35, 40, et cetera, where you just wake up and you're like, what, what did I do? that there's might be something that could be grown organically that's not going to be addictive that's going to help you and it's not a pill that's synthetic that's just making you know the pharmaceuticals just you know pump them out you know the, they have totally ruined so many families in this country over opioids they definitely should be in jail i don't know how they're not being prosecuted but i appreciate your time and I just really look forward to how everything's going to change. Richard Reed, 15 Berkside Ave, Brockton. Well, it's become a reality that here in Brockton, there's going to be a variety of different marijuana businesses established. But one of the things that is so important for us, and that's why we're here, and I want to thank all the counselors, those that sponsored this event and those that came, like Moises and uh, Shirley Asak, and I think I saw Jack Lally come in as well. Glad you're here. You're hearing the citizens, because uh, quite frankly, you all work for us. And we want to give you what's on our hearts and our minds and that we're really concerned about. Now, of course, with these businesses coming, one of the things we have to develop is we have to develop the regulations, the ordinances for them. And it's been mentioned uh, already, a thousand foot buffer. And of course, we know that the law now, uh, as written, states for K-5 through grade 12 schools only. That's all that's addressed. And they did say 500 feet, but communities are allowed to expand that or shrink it, as some have done. But not only do we want to have our schools uh, protected by a thousand foot buffer, but um, let me go on saying this, all religious institutions, not just Christian churches, everybody. We're all in this equal. Daycare facilities, public library, the YMCA, and any other facility like it that um, children frequent, uh, from any city or private playground, funeral homes. This is a result that I'm searching some of the other towns. Yeah, uh, nursing homes, uh, the hospital, medical clinics, a thousand feet from another marijuana business so that you don't have a high concentration of them in one area. A thousand feet from any correctional institution, halfway house, or addiction rehab center. These are all areas of risk, not that we're figuring out here in Brockton, but other communities in Massachusetts have already set this as their ordinances. And also as we look at Colorado, Washington, and other places, that have done this. Uh, when we think about other restrictions, you know, the restriction the mayor suggested on the second floor for downtown, uh, yes, it's out of sight, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, keeping it second above the ground or the um, basement, that's fine. Um, let's see, how do we get into these places? We have a 21 year of age to make it legal, and uh, so I propose that we have an ordinance and law and guidance for them that in order to enter the facility, you're gonna to have to produce a secure ID. 
a photo ID in order to be able to get in to prove your age. Um, also, business hours be restricted from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., just the eight-hour workday. I'm not even going to discuss about Sunday. That's a different mm -hmm. argument. Um, one of the things that it should be for the actual um, pickup when they come to purchase it, that it be put in a sealed bag, you know, just to make it, you know, so they won't just go outside and start using it because we don't want the impairment on the streets. Now, some other regulations of concern, and this comes really being concerned about the product, not the industry, but the product. I have a great concern over the edibles, so I would see no edibles at all. No vaping products. Um, all products would have to be, you know, again, uh, labeled as to the THC concentration. I know there's some guidelines in there already about it, but make sure that there's uh, retailer tracking. We know it's from seed to, to retail. Make sure that that is something that is enforceable. Um, let's see. Before any awarded license to operate a marijuana business in Brockton, the owner of that business must be able to produce a certified plan that confirms compliance with all the buffer zones. This should not be a cost to the city. It should not be a cost to the taxpayers. This should be something that the businessman that does this is responsible for. Um, watchdogs. <clears throat> Who's going to make sure that whoever is responsible is doing their job, whether they be you know, a part of a committee of um, citizens that are mandated through the city hall, whether it's the city councilors, uh, whoever it is, there should be an independent watchdog that is monitoring to make sure that all these rules are being followed. That when there is a violation, that the person that is guilty of it would be held accountable for it. Now for me, um, a first time violation of an underage buyer mm -hmm. in the retail store, to me means the, penalty, the only adequate penalty is you forfeit your business. Simple, gone. One offense. Uh, no three strikes there. Where are we going to put these places? I've been looking, trying to figure out where they could go. Um, I've walked off parts of downtown trying to figure out where it's 800 feet, 1,000 feet. And uh, there are a few spots that possibly could work, um, being away from the churches. Now, again, when I think of churches, religious uh, groups, there's 150 churches just in Brockton. That's a lot. I know, and that could get very restrictive, but they're very, many of them are very close to each other. But our zoning laws, as we have them now, the zoning in map that the mayor provided shows the entire route of North Main Street and Main Street as being C2. I know that that's not true because I know of a very large plot of land that's a C5 which would not be eligible for the marijuana businesses. Uh, also, a good quarter of that, particularly on North Main, is re residential. We need to make sure that all zoned plots are zoned properly. Otherwise, how can you get it right? We can't get it right as to where they're going to go unless we know. There are systems in place right now, GIS systems, so we can check it out, make sure that they meet all the um, requirements, but it is important that it be the um, businessmen that absorb any cost to be able to prove this to make sure that their plot of land is within all the buffer zones. And again, looking at the zoning for Brockton, we got a lot of work to do, not just because of this business entity coming in, but when you look at the state regulations in Brockton, or actually in the state, Churches are a C1, and yet when searching the uh, assessor's database, I've yet to find a single church in Brockton that is a C1. Most are C2, at least one is a C3, one's a C5, yet with a C2 right across the street, um, it's a mess. It's something that needs to be addressed so that proper decisions can be made. And I'm not sure who's lap that's going to fall in, but before any business goes forward, it needs to be made sure that it falls within the existing zoning regulations 
plot by plot. And again, keeping in mind the buffers. Thanks. Thank but I first want to correct some inaccurate statements that I heard. Um, I heard that the industry wants to make money off of the poor people, which is not true. Many wealthy people smoke marijuana. I do know a lot of people who smoke it for medical reasons and for pleasure, and they're not all broke. So that's an inaccuracy I wanted to clear up. And also, um, I think that it's a very bad idea to consider putting these shops on the outskirts of Brockton. The benefits of keeping them downtown in Brockton is to bring businesses and foot traffic, as someone else said, to our city. Why would we want to put them on the outskirts for people to travel in and leave and not pass through our stores and pass through our restaurants and stop at convenient places and all the local businesses? This is an opportunity to bring more businesses to the downtown area. Right now when you drive through that street, it's so depressing. You have empty buildings, they're falling apart, and this is an opportunity for these retail shops to come in, renovate these buildings, put in elevators for handicap accessible. They're upstairs, they're downstairs, and they're full of security. So that means that they're all going to be contained in one area with security. In addition to, you know, our police officers that are on the street, but they are required to have security. They are highly regulated, so a lot of the questions another gentleman had, those, those regulations are already in place. The regulations are about 78 pages long, which is more than, I run adult day health centers and ours are 28 pages. This is 78 pages of regulations, you do require an ID. So it is a safe population going in these places, they're monitored, they're checked out. It's not going to be a, like a bunch of wild people running through the city of Brockton. It's actually going to bring people dressed like Gary Leonard and myself to these places. So I think people have a misconception. They're not educated enough or did enough research to see um, the type of people that would be coming to these places. I think people have the wrong perception. But I strongly urge you, and I hope that what I've said will help you with your decision, to keep these contained in one area. To spread them out throughout the city would be harder to monitor. <coughs> Keeping them together would be easier for us. And again, the added security in these places. There's one other point I wanted to make that someone said, the revenue. Someone mentioned that the revenue isn't what we think it is. Google it. The statistics are there, and I bet you someone else in this room has it. I wasn't prepared to speak to that. But the revenue is. The dazzling dollars, it's there, and Brockton needs it, but we need to do it right. We need to consider where they go, and to spread them out wouldn't make sense. We want that foot traffic into the city of Brockton, in downtown, so we can bring businesses, maybe more restaurants, retail, dress shops. There used to be closing stores down there. They're all closed. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Thomas. I live in Ward 3. Uh, when I came, I wasn't planning to say anything, but I was listening to this. When Ollie, I don't know if he's still here, was talking and he was naming three streets where people went down, and I thought he was going to say, oh, but you can smell marijuana everywhere when you drive down those streets. That's not where he went with that. Th the fact is that it's here, and it's legal, and the uh, prohibitionists um, can't change that. So the rational thing, and it looks like we're doing it now, is to, you know, have these uh, these inst uh, institutions sell it, make some profit, etc. But the big one of the big things, and this is a personal experience thing. Um, one of the adv last week, you probably had heard the story where 20 people nearly died on New Haven Green, smoking marijuana. They thought. It's fentanyl lace, they almost die, they get all the police to come and all that sort of thing. If you were a stoner in the 60s and 70s, and then you've come back to this, what is out there, you know, unregulated, can be very frightening. This is going to be something that, you know, and a couple people mentioned, it's going to be middle class people like me who can go in there and get something that has been tested and all that sort of business. So I think that since this is here, and I love this discussion we're having, because it's not about the referendum or not, 
uh, and, and I think we're going to have a lot of advantages. The last thing I just wanted to say, because I went to one of these things about the referendum and whether we should vote, and there's people saving, saying that, uh, you know, the five counselors were thwarted in their attempts to have democracy. And somebody here uh, quoted Franklin Roosevelt, you know, and something about this. Uh, you know, when we elected Roosevelt, we have a representative democracy here. We elect people to make good decisions for us, people that have the time and are dedicated to make these decisions. Roosevelt didn't have a referendum before he ordered, you know, the invasion in D-Day. When, when we just had this big tax cut, we didn't all get in trains and, and you know, go down to Washington and vote on the referendum, uh, on the tax cut. We elect people to do this, and that was the city council. When we had that thing saying that we want to give up, we elect you, to make decisions with time and that sort of thing. And I don't, th I think that the six people who voted to vote it down the referendum, which I think would have been ugly, there would have been tons of money on both sides. Disinformation campaigns would have been rampant. And instead, the six people saved us from that and gave us instead this sort of rational dialogue in which we're going to come up with something much better than what we have. So thank you. I'm Skip Graziano. I live at 14 Colgate Road, Brockton, and I've worked with youth all my life. I'm on the Brockton Community Schools, of, Schools Advisory Board, and I do agree with the last couple of speakers where, the, where, where they want to put it in the reverend, but I am not totally in favor of it. If you have it, I knew when downtown was downtown. I want to thank all the counselors and all the work that they've done, because I know with the little bit I do, it takes a lot out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Hello, my name is Jeremy Marcellus. I'm a healthcare professional with over 14 years of experience uh, in various treatment modalities, but specializing in detox therapy and alcohol addiction. And I've noticed that tonight's conversation is really focused on the business benefits. Sorry, you just have to state your address for the, for the minutes. Oh, we, we the I'm, a, I'm now a Brockton resident, okay. but I work in Brockton. Oh, my address where I live? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I live in Randolph, Massachusetts, 38 okay. Nelson Drive. Jeremy Marcellus, LPN. Okay. 30 what? Hmm? 30 what? 38 Nelson Drive. Yes. Okay, so um, to focus, uh, I've noticed that tonight's conversation is really focused on the business benefits of marijuana and THC, which is great in and of itself. However, to focus on the health care benefits, specifically for those people who would like to use the benefits of marijuana, like CBD, without having to go through the red tape of getting their marijuana card, I think there's going to be a great opportunity for those people. I'm talking to the people who suffer from anxiety, depression, whatever. If you do not have your marijuana card and the fact that this is not going to be legal and you're going to have areas in Brockton to purchase this at the very least, I'm very happy for this city and I hope more people take advantage of that right they're going to have now in this city. Um, and once again, I really, I think someone spoke here earlier, they spoke about their, um, they sp spoke briefly about their addiction past. I can't remember the person, I think they already left here. But they made a key, they made a point in reference to how they're afraid that with marijuana, people are just going to become addicted to that, which they can. However, Marijuana in and of itself, and CBD in and of itself, is not an addictive substance. Anyone, in my opinion, whoever becomes quote unquote addicted to marijuana, I think they will definitely have more of an addictive personality versus that substance in and of itself creating the addiction. And for those of you guys who think you're above becoming addicted to anything, let me make this one point here. Does anybody in here drink coffee? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> but if you do, and if the words, hey, you know what? Don't talk to me, I haven't had my coffee yet. Guess what, you're addicted to caffeine, okay? So to get rid of this stigma of addiction is what I really want to get out of people's mind. But if I were to make a point about the whole business point of view of this, as a nurse, I travel up and down throughout many communities in Massachusetts. I drive through their downtowns, I drive through their neighborhoods. Brockton, from a visual point of view, to, for me to be nice, you could do much better. <laughs> and you have an amazing opportunity to do much better if, in my opinion, you focus on 
putting these businesses downtown, just to start off. Um, someone made a point earlier about you know, some other communities, they put it on the outskirts, and years later, they, they, two or three layers, they're really, no, let's bring it downtown anyways. Downtown needs to be the hub of any city. When I drive through the downtown of this city versus the downtown, let's say a Taunton, a downtown of a Boston, um, mm -hmm. Brockton may never get to that level of a Boston. It could if the people in here want it to be. But at the very least, if you just take this opportunity and focus on the natural benefits that could happen if you just put it in a concentrated area like downtown, I think Brockton has the opportunity to really grow. And everyone has the opportunity to benefit. And just one more point I want to make before I leave, going pivoting back to the healthcare point of view. Uh, in this room, I noticed a nice mix of people, younger, older, everything in between. These of this last tip I want to give is for my people who are older than me. <laughs> also, I don't want to say old people, you know what I mean? But from my experience of seeing my geriatric clients who use marijuana products basically off of the CBD point of view, they have a tremendous increase in terms of quality of life. So once again, this is a product that I highly recommend that everyone in this room do their own valid research. And when you're doing your research, I'm not saying stay off of Facebook, stay off of social media, but just do your due diligence. And that goes if you're watching the local news, CNN, I don't care. Do your own due diligence, do your own research. Everything I said tonight is from my own point of view as a healthcare professional. I've seen people going through withdrawals. I've seen people who are sick. I've seen people who have suffered. And I've also firsthand seen the benefits of this substance and how it just helps people tremendously. Cancer, anxiety, depression, addiction, everything. Good luck to Brockton. Well, I'm not going to say good luck to Brockton because I'm moving back out here, but and I look forward to moving back out here, but good luck to you guys in terms of how you handle the business side of this, and I hope you guys really take advantage of the opportunity you have. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Matt, a Brockton resident. I'll give my address. Can I give my address privately afterwards? Yeah, but I didn't get your name. Matt, first name. I'll give you my last name uh, after, if you don't mind. Um, I'm not for or against it. Um, per se. I've seen all sides of it. People use it, people don't use it. Uh, I don't know how long the medical facility, the medical dispensary has been there. Anybody, a few years? <coughs> Haven't seen a problem with it. That's great. I'm for it on the outskirts of town. I am a firm believer. I've lived here for 43 years and we could put Disneyland downtown and people wouldn't come. Um, it just won't happen. Um, has downtown changed in the last 30 years? Ganley's left downtown, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago? Mary? Mary, do you know how long ago Ganley's left downtown? Long time, right? Yeah. We're not getting anything back downtown. Um, this is all about the money. And it's been planned for, you know, a while. People, the people that are going to get the licenses, are gonna get the licenses. They've they've known it, and it's pretty well known throughout the city. I don't think any of you up there are, uh, you know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, well, I think I have a pretty good idea. Um, it's about the money, so I encourage you to take your time. Um, you know, longer is is safer. It's better. It's better for the city. Um, I heard some stuff about, you know, up on second floors. Yes, that's great. But you have to look at what's on the bottom floors of those businesses, too. Um, is, you know, is it a restaurant where children can come? Um, and, yes, I understand that when you go get your marijuana, that it's in a bag and stapled or whatever. It's sealed. But, you know, it's like going to a liquor store. You can't stop the person from cracking it as soon as they walk out the door. And currently there aren't testing, adequate testing, to if somebody is pulled over. Uh, you know, you look at that state trooper, I believe his name was Clardy, uh, that was killed by somebody under the influence of marijuana. And I, there's just been far too little uh, research done on that, on the testing. Um, people are going to lose lives. And as far as somebody mentioned security, yeah, they, they will. There'd be plenty of security because it's big money. 
It's big money. It's real big money. So, of course, they're going to secure their facilities. But I also heard Chief Crowley speak about the 4th of July and that there were 13 police officers on the 4th of July. 13. If something happens at one of these facilities, you know, it stretches the police too, too thin, way too thin. Um, there just needs to be a lot of thought put into this. And I don't think, I think it's, it's always, it's been about the money too much. Um, so I rambled. I wasn't going to come. I started on the enterprise, so I figured I'd get down there. I forgot about it. I thank you for having this. And again, I, I just hope you guys take your time. Um, there are, uh, you know, a lot of money on the line. And yeah, money would be great for Brockton. Um, but keeping us safe is a little more important, I think. Um, thank you. Okay, just, just for planning purposes, I, I wouldn't want to cut anyone off, even though we've run a little over. Do we have one, one more speaker? Anyone else uh, that wants to speak? One more over there? No, two more over there. Oh, I'm three sorry. There. Three? three? Okay. All right, then we'll okay. go that way. Thank you, counselors. Um, I'll be brief. I want to specifically talk about cultivation and... Name and... I oh, just... sorry. Joanne Zygmunt, 12 Wellsford Street, Brockton. Uh, tonight I want to specifically talk about marijuana cultivation and water use. Um, I was recently appointed to the Central Plymouth County Water District Commission um, on behalf of the residents of Brockton, and I've learned a lot about the water situation here, as I'm sure many of you have probably followed over the past few years with the desalinization plant and other issues. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission, just to be clear about that, I'm speaking as a resident of Brockton. I think that many of you will agree here tonight that the future of the city belongs to the young people. And we have, fortunately, many young people in this city that are engaged in what's happening across all the issues. Water is a huge problem. Um, water in Brockton is really cheap, and I think everybody would love to keep it that way. But that is a huge bonus to folks that are looking to cultivate marijuana in the city. Water is a significant input into the agricultural crop. Um, depending on which plant and what the situation is, it can use up to six gallons of water every single day for one plant. So imagine a big space filled with lots of plants. We can argue about this later. Um, it can take up a lot of water. Now there are cannabis producers around the country that have looked at really fantastic innovations to minimize water use. So they're using things like taking the uh, humidity in the air, sucking that back out and recirculating it into the crops. They're looking at things like aquaponics, which saves considerable amounts of water. There are a lot of innovations there. In Colorado, in California, in Oregon, for the most part, water is significantly more expensive than it is here in Brockton. There is a significant financial motivation for cultivators to save water. That doesn't really exist so much here in Brockton, that same argument. So what I would like to see the council consider is ways that we can encourage potential cultivators to use water efficiently through innovation. I think that's something that we really have to think about. For some people in the city, more water use equates to more revenue. And I'm not gonna get into the details of how just tragically inaccurate that is, but it is. Um, we have a serious infrastructure problem in this city. Our pipes are falling apart. We don't have the money to pay to fix that. We are talking about taking out significant loans to purchase a desalinization plant that will not even supply the city with half of its water needs. I don't know how many of you have been following what's happening out in the Silver Lake and Montponset um, pond area last week, but in half of Montponset pond, the cyanobacteria count has gone above the state limit. There are future potential problems with that bacteria getting into the other side of the pond and then causing our costs for water treatment to significantly skyrocket. So I'll stop there, but a big thing, I think, is to look at how we can incentivize water use and efficiency for cultivators. If I was going to go into the marijuana business, I'm a small business owner, I'd be looking at Brockton as a great place to grow cannabis, partly because there are lots of vacant factories that could need little renovation in order to get them up and running for cannabis. Water is cheap. Electricity is expensive. Um, 
And on electricity, just to note as well, you might be thinking, oh, well, we can't really regulate how people use water or energy. Boulder has actually started to regulate how cultivators are using energy. They now require that marijuana cultivators offset 100% of their use or pay a fee. That's on energy. They haven't done it on water. But if you read about what's happening out in the West, cities are now looking at ways that they can control how much water cultivators are using because it's becoming a problem. And what I don't want to see is my taxes going up to pay for future bonds to invest in infrastructure that we've had to create in the first place because cultivation has skyrocketed. Um, so I just ask you to consider that, please. Hi, I'm Larry Curtis on 153 Dixon Road here in Brockton. I've been a resident of the city of Brockton for about 20 years now. I moved to the city of Brockton when my children were young because this was an affordable location. I'm a Boston born and raised boy. I wanted to live in a city that provided many, many services. I chose Brockton and I don't regret that decision at one bit. But in particular, over the last 12 to 15 years, I've seen this city turn its nose up to billions of dollars in investment from multiple programs throughout the last 15 years. You sit back and go back to around 2007, you look at the Good Times Pavilion that was supposed to come into Ward 7, that was delayed, and then we had the market crash in 2008. We had a power plant that would have generated over $700 million of its life cycle for 30 years. We had the casino that would have been in excess of $650 million investment in addition to construction jobs and permanent jobs to this city that would have been good paying money. And then we had the Aquaria, power, the Aquaria water plant sitting out there right now that we pay six and a half million dollars and continue to pay each year for something we don't utilize. And then ultimately, we're looking at the marijuana issue. What is the message that our public officials have sent to the business community? We do not want business in downtown Brockton. We do not want investment. I want to take a cue from Larry Boyd from the Brockton Hub a minute ago uh, earlier tonight. Take a chance. Stop the NIMBY syndrome that's going on in our city. Look at the silver lining of these projects and make it work. And Larry was right. If it's not going to, if something goes wrong, we have the ability to correct that. That's part of what your democracy is all about. Stop the NIMBY syndrome and take a chance. That's the only way we're going to turn this city around. Thank you. Um, my name is. Oh, Sean Polonese, and I live at 181 Forest Avenue. Uh, I feel that with this, um, this dispensary opening up, especially with the new generation of entrepreneurs, it shows more of a understanding towards them in the sense that they feel more open to open up a business around downtown, if it's going to be built near downtown. But at the same time, we still have to issue laws where it's, we have to make a safe place to smoke, I mean, we'll utilize these um, products, but at the same time, we have to watch for the kids who are very influential too. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, the kids, especially young adults as well, and teenagers are the next generation who are gonna be running and um, making sure the city is being a spot for revenue and great <coughs> and prosperous, <laughs> sorry, excuse me, great and prosperous um, business. That's the word, thank you. And I feel like with this being utilized and um, instilled into the city, it'll show more of an understanding towards the youth as well. But at the same time, safety should be first. Because there are certain businesses, for example, Dunkin' Donuts um, at our mall, Westgate Mall, that has been robbed twice in two weeks. And I feel that with that being showed and advertised on places like the Enterprise, people will look at that and think that maybe it's not a great idea for people to open up businesses in Brockton. But at the same time, that is a quagmire, and we should get over it. So we have to look towards a better future and sustaining more money for, for those who need it. Like, if you walk down downtown Brock, um, Boston, Brockton, sorry, you see a lot of homeless people who don't even have jobs, and they're going through a lot of stress. I'm not saying um, marijuana should be a replacement for um, stress, but in a sense, especially in the upcoming generation, the upcoming decade, there's a lot of people who use it illegally being scared that they're going to be getting caught using it. But in the same sense, if people have, people have those um, marijuana cards, they'll, be f they'll feel more comfortable to utilize them, thus taking off the edge of stress 
and getting caught and um, being charged as not a felon, but being charged, whether it's like a petty theft or a petty crime. And I feel like if you instill this weed dispensary in Brockton, you'll see somewhat of a change. Thank you for your time. Good night. Uh, Marlon Green, 57 Custer Street, 11 Ward 3. Um, I've been a clergy member for approximately 20 years now. Um, and as, as a clergy member, um, I encounter numerous uh, families. And I cannot begin to tell you the number of parents and children that I've had to sit with and deal with a variety of issues, including uh, drug use, including the usage and the selling of marijuana as one of those things. And as a clergy member, I've had the unfortunate experience of watching families and lives torn apart because of this issue of drug use. And not just marijuana, coke, alcohol, and you name it. With that said, as, as a clergy member, I voted against the I voted against the legalization of marijuana. On the other hand, I can wear the hat of an economist. Um, I hold a degree in economics, and so I understand the delicate balance between the quality of life that we desire to have in our community. And at the same time, I appreciate the need for economic development in our city as well. And so I think we're at the point where, yes, it is the law, and it's not one that I've, I'm supported, but it is the law of the land at this point. And if that's going to go forward, then I think the only thing that I can say to the uh, counsel and to those who are listening is one, thank you for doing what an elected official is supposed to do. And that is, you take time and you listen to the voters, to the men and women who have elected you and have entrusted you to make decisions that are going to impact us and our families for years to come. I think it's fair to say that as a city, we've not always entered into uh, the best deals and the best contracts and commitments that are in the best interests of the citizens. And so I appreciate uh, members of the committee uh, members of the council, rather, and members of the city taking the time to engage in a civil discourse where this issue is concerned. All points are valid. And though I hold certain religious beliefs and convictions, as I sit here today, I understand and I respect every voice and every opinion tonight. I really do. I will ask uh, the members of the council to do this. Number one, let us be diligent and careful in crafting whatever ordinance and rules and legislation that we're going to uh, consider and put in place for this. With that in mind, I think a buffer zone is essential and it is important. And I will ask you, please protect our places of worship. Please protect our schools, our children, our sons and our daughters. Protect our health care facility, rehab facilities, 
make sure that there is a buffer zone and a reasonable buffer zone around those facilities. Number three, I would like to see a transparent process where uh, the issuing of licenses is concerned. A transparent process where we are comfortable and we are confident in the leaders that we have in place and those who are making decisions that are going to impact us and our children and our generations to come. It, it, it was noted earlier, so I won't get into the details of who is going to issue, which body is going to undo that, but I would just like to see a transparent and an accountable process for the, uh, the issuing of licenses. The, and the fourth thing, and that is uh, quality of life. If the industry and the product is going to be here. You cannot talk about the industry without talking about the product. You can't talk about the product without the industry. So if the industry and the product is going to be here in Brockton, it's going to bring additional traffic into the city because the majority of the South Shore communities have banned the sale of recreational marijuana. And so we're going to become somewhat of a hub. And there is a great unknown. We don't know what we're going to attract, or who we're going to attract, rather, in terms of demographics into the city. I know it was said earlier, I understand that we're going to attract a middle class and people who dress like me and people who look like I'm this and so on, but the fact of the matter is, we don't know. We're going to attract people, but we don't know. Therefore, it is crucial that there is enforcement in place. We need to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place, we have the resources in place, we have the police officers in place to enforce the rules that we have on the books and to further protect our residents. Let's not enter into this deal or venture off into this industry and we are ill prepared uh, in protecting the rights and liberties of the residents who live in this great city of Brockton. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be heard and to be informed. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Willett, number six Beach Street, Berkeley, Massachusetts. I, um, I, I listen to the, uh, the people speaking and I kind of relate the marijuana thing to, to alcohol, a drug, being, being a drug. We walk into the liquor store with our kid at our side. He, he, he's buying um, chips, you know, and it's a liquor store. His parents walk out of the liquor store and open their beer. What, what makes marijuana different than alcohol? And why do we need a thousand feet from a from a church or, or from a, 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 um, a, a daycare center where a parent is walking a child in, picking them up and walking them out. You know, but we, we're gonna take our kids into liquor stores. I, I, I don't think that the regulation that um, the people that wanna over-regulate this is beneficial to the industry and I definitely I think what we're doing is pushing the entrepreneur from the city. I, I think we need to start welcoming this industry. Um, we, we look at it and the last guy saying, geez, um, we're not just going to be servicing Brockton, but we're going to be servicing surrounding communities. It is going to be as big as they say. It sounds as though it's going to be even a lot bigger. You know, our, um, Right now in Boulder, Colorado, they got 100,000 residents. We got 100,000 residents here, but they're saying we're going to service another 300,000 with all the surrounding communities. I, so. I see that now if we're going to be selling retail, we're, we're, we're going to want to be making uh, to, to sell wholesale. So we're going to have grow, operation, uh, grow ops in we have to look at, right now the state has 10 different licenses for grow ops. They have 100, um, 10,000 square feet, 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100,000. There's 10 different licenses for different size 
grow ups that you can have. Um, I don't see a reason why a mom and pop store, any business area in Brockton, couldn't have a grow up on the second floor. They're closed to um, services. You can't get in unless you work there. They don't deal with the public. They have no front signage. The windows are all painted or boarded shut. And it's a completely sealed and all odor has to be controlled. You could put one of them in my neighbor's house. Why, why would we fight where a grow operation Oh yeah, there is one in my neighbor's house. Because it's legal to grow in every basement in the city as well. So for us to limit where a grow op is going, what we're limiting is 3% of the total sale of marijuana to the town of, Ta of the city of Taunton and the town of Oldbrook. We get paid when we sell other cities marijuana, we get paid. For us to limit that industry to a C1 or a C3, is, is ludicrous when, ha when those C3s have schools and, and stuff around them. You know, a grow operation being separate from a retail operation should be able to be put in any commercial area in the city because nobody's even going to know it's there. The city's going to make $5,000 off the sale of that license. They're going to make 3% of everything they sell outside of our city. Our city won't have to buy anything from any other cities, so we're not going to be paying other cities the 3% that's ours. The more uh, wholesale that we're selling, the more revenue that's coming into the city. I hear Boulder, Colorado, 21, 22 um, dispensaries. They've got 45 grow operations. And nobody knows where they are because the only way you can find out is go to City Hall and ask for the registry to ask where they are. Because no one goes into grow operations. You're not allowed in them. No one, it's to, to limit a grow operation and to limit the location of a grow operation is um, it, it's throwing money away. With, and not just that. When you limit uh, your grow operations and you limit your dispensaries, but you want to remember, if these dispensaries take off six dispensaries and they're going to do a hundred million dollars, you're going to have the dis six dispensaries making 10, 15 million dollars a piece of profit. I want 20 dispensaries and I want 20 millionaires in the city. I want three or four. Let's all be millionaires. Let's all open grow operations. Let's open dispensaries. Let's make the revenue. Let's give it to the city. Give them all their 6%. Give them the 3%, stop laying off teachers, and move forward. This industry can support the city with a lot of extra money that we don't have right now, and it's ours. We deserve it. Right now in the city, we're selling roughly 50, 70 pounds of marijuana. It's wholesale. It's sold by the kids. It's a black market. It's sold at the high schools. If you want to buy marijuana in the city, you're not going to the entrepreneur living. You're going to the kids down the street that sell part on the corner or whatever they do. Let's control that industry. Take it from the kids. Keep the money. Keep the revenue. Keep the profits to the city. And we give it back to the good kids in school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We... We have really run over the 8 o'clock limit, but I, I think this has been very be beneficial. On my behalf, I thank everyone for a great debate, great discussion. Uh, Councillor Sullivan. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody that came here tonight. It was really, uh, it was, I think, really valuable information, and uh, it was a great listening uh, event, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening. And we also want to extend uh, to uh, Philip and Aaron from Broughton Community Access for having the patience for sticking around through the whole thing. We had told them it was going to be an hour and a half, and it went on to two hours. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And just remember that we're always ready to listen. You can still email and call us if you didn't feel like speaking in public tonight. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it.